everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee and talking about anything and everything. We may use explicit language, and we'll almost certainly drop F-bombs, but none of that is the point of the drive of the content, so consider us PG-13. There will be rants and raves, and today a lot of readings. There'll be conflicting creative advice driven by a lot of different points of view. Today, we're having a special Femcast, as it's just me and my guest, Alice Cornwell. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. This is episode 11, Alice Reads My Rom Zom Com. I sold this story back in 2016 in a wonderful anthology that was a romantic zombie anthology, and it was oddly fun to write. And it was based on news stories that were going by about what they called the zombie drug. So here's the question of what if you didn't know you were a zombie? Alice is going to read this to us today because Alice is trying to decide if she wants a great career in being an audible voice actor. So take it away, Alice. Thank you. This is Living Dead in Miami by Jeannie Warner. LucindaWu.LiveJournal.com This is going to be my last LJ entry ever. I want to get it all out there before I finish things. I'm leaving this post so you few who really understand and love me will know what happened and know why I did it. You'll miss me more than anyone here in Miami, which is totally sad. Tony, I want to say I'll miss you, but I'm hoping I won't. It hurts me that you were always talking about your freedom, your ability to be so totally open and loving to everyone. But I finally come to realize that What it really meant is that you wanted to fuck me, but not ever give me any of your heart. You talked a real good game, but I know you didn't feel like I do. We wouldn't keep hanging around Alexandria. Do you think I don't have feelings? Every time we'd be hanging out and you'd be all, Alexandria this, and Alexandria's so smart. Listen to this brilliant thing she said. I wanted to scream, or cry, or both. Did you talk about me to her? No. I don't think you talked about me to anyone. I think I was your dirty little secret. I gave you my heart, and you drop kicked it into the gutter. I keep clicking back and forth between this entry and the email you accidentally sent me today, talking to her. Was it accidental? Was it on purpose? Are you that cruel that you'd say all that shit about me to her when I didn't know about it? Stupid me. I had to call and ask what you meant, and you with your, I'm going to be honest here, Lou, you tore me to shreds. How come you say honest when what you really mean is fucking brutal and mean? Maybe I didn't finish my degree like perfect, almost a doctor Alexandria, but hearing that you think I'm stupid and vain and shallow was just too much. No more. I've done my nails one last time. Put the lightning bolts on the red stiletto-style manicure you said was so cool when we met. You won't remember it, but that night in Carabas is why I never quit, even when my jerk of a manager would hit on me or grab my ass. I stayed for you, and for the memories we made there when you'd come in after work. I worked two jobs there when you showed up and killed myself to always look good. My hair looks great, too. You liked it when I dyed it blonde, so I'm blonde one last time for you. I hope that when they find me, the news comes and you can see them carry me out on a stretcher. My hair will be down around my shoulders, just how you liked. I hope you'll realize that you ruined me. You broke me, and there's just no fixing your broken toys. I want you to cry for me, for all the crying I've done for you taken all the pills in the house along with those purple wave I got from Dorinda and I've already had most of this bottle of wine and some vodka. I've just swallowed them now. I'm wearing my sexiest black dress and I'm gonna lie down on the couch and be the prettiest fucking corpse you ever saw. Goodbye, Tony. And goodbye, my LJ peeps. You were right. I never should have left home to come down here. You've been the best friends I've ever known. This isn't a reflection on you. I'm just tired of hurting and tired of feeling sad. I'm not me anymore. Farewell. LucindaWu.LiveJournal.com 
Holy shit, it didn't work. I think I've just slept 12 hours according to the computer. I feel really great though. Clearly that's what I needed, a really good long sleep. I can't remember the last time when I just slept and slept until I woke up. Maybe that's the solution to all the world's problems, more sleep and a really good manicure. I just finished reading the comments y'all left me on my last post. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. Yeah, he was totally not worth it. I don't really know why I was so upset over that guy. I mean, I think of him now and I don't feel anything. I don't think it's even just being numb. It's gone. I want to thank all of you for being so supportive. I'm reading back over my last few weeks worth of posts and I'm totally freaked out that I was ever such a ball of drama. Well, this drama llama is over it. Oh. B-E-R. So, Michelle, like, don't call the cops to break down my door just because I hear they don't pay for it, right? Anyway, uh, kisses for the sweet thoughts. I miss you too, sweetie. It seems a waste not to use this dress and my nails all done up, though. I think I'm going to go out and meet Brittany and Dorinda over at Cameo. But first, I got to do this for some closure. I'm going to drop by Tony's place and tell him we're cool. And maybe even drop off his jacket I borrowed. It's totally pleather anyway, and there's a hole in the pocket. Now there's symbology for you, huh? All that love I had for him, and even his jacket wasn't real or classy. Gonna go serve up some power bitch realness. And if he never appreciates what he's gonna be missing, then too bad. Wow, I think the purple wave is still working. Everything looks totally different, and I can smell everything in, like, texture. The whole apartment looks different, fuzzier, and sharper in color. I feel great like the fucking queen of South Miami. Look out nightlife, here I come. Anyway, brushing my hair and I'm out of here. I need to change up my conditioner like you advertise, letter jetter. My hair's falling out like crazy on this cheap stuff. Kiss kiss till later. Listen to woo.livejournal.com Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Something is wrong. I mean, like, really wrong. I'm hiding in the house with all the lights out and the door's locked. Trying to look like there's no one home. Any second now, the cops are going to show up. At least, I'm afraid they are. I don't know what to do. I'm so freaked out. I think Tony's dead. There's, uh, maybe I killed him? I'm so confused. How did everything go all wrong so sudden? I went over there to just, you know, make peace. Only he had that Alexandria over. She was all naked on the couch and all, baby, don't answer the door. I was just gonna shove a little on the door and poke my head in and say, whatever, bitch, you want him, you got him. Just stay out of my restaurant and my life. Only Tony stumbled at my push and went falling back. So I was just standing there in the open doorway they're all staring at me then and looking all scared. I was like, what? You think I'm going to go all Glen Close and Fatal Attraction on your ass? I don't want your douchey boyfriend, bitch. Here, shake on it. You can just have him. I stepped forward to say that. But before I could, Tony screamed, stay away from her, you freak. And jumps my ass with that baseball bat he keeps by the door. Then he hit me. Holy fuck, he hit me. He actually hit my ribs with the baseball bat. I know, I'm totally in shock here. I was so filled with adrenaline that I didn't feel anything. I just heard a crack as my ribs broke and then I screamed and jumped on him. I was like, fuck this manicure, I'm gonna leave my claw marks on his face. Okay, I was pretty crazed with adrenaline. I admit it, his face opened right up under my nails and suddenly blood was flying everywhere and his head slammed back hard on the ground. Alexandria screamed and jumped on me and we were all rolling all over the floor of his place, pulling hair and yelling at each other. I yanked a whole handful of hair out of that bitch's head and it came away with her skin still attached. Gag me, right? 
Anyway, she starts screaming like she's shitting a porcupine and rolls away to go crawl fast over to Tony. He was just lying there and she was all, oh God, he's dead. There was all that begging me not to kill her and crying and screaming. I, I freaked, so I just ran out of there all the way down the stairs and home. Oh, I just realized I'm cleaning gunk on my nails with my teeth. That's so totally gross. And I'm totally, oh my God, that for a minute there, I was like enjoying the taste. Ugh. I mean, you can get diseases from that kind of shit. It wouldn't surprise me if Tony had some kind of STD because how he couldn't keep zipped. I'm gonna go wash my hands off with some alcohol if I have any vodka left. Okay, back now. I'm sitting in front of the TV with all the drapes drawn. I got the sound away down so no one can hear it. Watching to see if they start talking about a manhunt. Woman hunt? Fabulous blonde quest? I poured myself a drink, but I don't really want it. I just used the vodka and lime to get cleaned up and the smell of blood out of my hands. It still smells pretty strong, like a good steak. The news says the police are still looking for why those guys keep going crazy and chewing on faces. How totally disgusting is that? I mean, it's like the latest in revolting druggy habits. Here, shoot up this foggy stuff designed to put down rhinos and go out and eat people's faces off. At least the latest two, the reporter says, didn't get naked. That naked face chewer totally grossed me out, you know? How is that fun? Anyway, the news lady, who looks really bad in that shade of pink, by the way, is all about how the police are on the lookout for more of these people, like it's an outbreak. I mean, if it's the penalty for being homeless these days, you do some bad drugs, you go crazy. Man, it's like rabies. I saw a dog with rabies once. It foamed around the mouth a little and just kept biting people when its head was mostly bashed in. It's so gross. Anyway, another hour has passed and the police haven't shown up. Tony and his skank are probably just messing with me anyway. I'm gonna go out, meet my girl Lisa Cameo, and do some dancing. Lucinda Wu. Dot live journal, dot com. This evening was a total bummer. End to end. I got to Cameo and don't even start asking me about all the creeps that take the party bus these days. There was this guy who was flirting with my ass all the way from Pizano Street parking lot to the club. Although to be fair, I did look particularly fine. I guess he can be forgiven. And I almost feel bad about clawing his eyes out when he pinned me in the back of the bus, rubbing up all over me. How come guys have to be like that anyway? I mean, just because I'm barely wearing this awesome black dress and killer heels doesn't mean I want to be mauled and drooled on. He must have been drunk, though. I mean, I finally shoved him away after he started screaming, but he cracked his head on the window or something and that shut him up. I hope he just passed out there and I got off quick. Cameo itself was fabulous, with a capital F. John John was spinning downstairs, and the floor was already packed when I got in. I got a Cosmo at the bar, head upstairs for some social debauchery with my girlies. Brittany and Dorinda were there, and already flying around the floor. I hung up by the catwalk, sipped my drink, down to where I wouldn't spill it. I need a bartender, though. I mean, it barely tasted like anything. I figured I'd tell the owner later that the new bartender wasn't using good vodka and juice because this thing was totally undrinkable. So I left my drink on the table and just waited into the dancing, but I got to B&D and Brittany was just totally freaks out. She's like, OMG, girl, you look like shit. Dorinda barely noticed, but she was pretty glazed over like she was on Purple Wave 2. We left her rubbing up all over a guy as B dragged me off to the ladies' room. I stopped and looked in the mirror and I freaked right then and there. I have never left the house looking so trashed. Luckily, Brittany had a whole purse full of MAC, so we spackled some color on my face and fixed my lashes and lipstick. She was real sweet, asking about Tony and everything. I guess she just figured I was trying to make a brave face of everything, but I convinced her. I was totally over him. I didn't feel a thing, really. Just empty inside. She's like, no wonder you're all pale and droopy. Thank God for friends, right? They're the one who look after you when you're down. I couldn't quite tell her about what happened at Tony's place. I mean, 
Normally, I tell her everything, but this felt a little strange still. I don't know if they were just fucking with me or what happened precisely. It's all a little fuzzy already anyway. Still, B's been here for me since I moved, the way you guys were back in Atlanta. She fussed for a bit and we must have used half of her concealer before I look like myself again. Okay, maybe a little tired, but when you smile real big, wear a push-up bra, and no one knows those the eye bags. I fluff the girls, hug B, and two of us headed out on the floor. I don't know where it went all wrong, but I think it was that angry looking goth girl with clumpy mascara that started it. She was all dancing aggressive, throwing elbows and knuckles around like she was caving out the whole center of the dance floor for herself. And she slammed her body into me and was all, hey girl, back off. Angry goth girl flipped out and totally threw a punch before I even finished talking. Bitch hit me in the mouth with my mouth open. The edge of her finger was in my mouth, so I just bit down hard. Served her right. Anyway, she lost it when I bit the tip of her finger off. This girl throws down and starts wailing on me with everything she's got. B and D fell backward way into the crowd, and everyone started fighting at once with all the crowding on the floor. Now, I don't start fights, but I'll be damned if some skinny hoe bag in crushed velvet is going to get the better of me in front of my peeps. I hit, I bit, I scratched, I went total rambolina on her skinny ass. Then suddenly she's on top of me and not moving. I shoved her off and got up, wiping at my mouth. It was crazy and everyone was still going at it all around us. This one guy fell backward off a catwalk and it started to mess downstairs too, I think. Then Dorinda starts screaming because she sees them all over bloody and B and I grabbed her arms to hustle her out of there through the crowds. Brittany's got my back and she's all telling D how it totally wasn't my fault. I was just defending B in our little spot on the floor, really. Anyway, Dorinda starts raving about the purple wave and how she shouldn't have taken it. Uh, that's when B and I realized she was having a real bad trip. So I put the two of them in a taxi to go home. I still have my bus ticket back and if the creep wasn't there, it'd be a good trip. Hey, I really have the munchies. I'll be back to tell them when I've eaten a little something. Lucinda Wu dot live journal dot com thanks for the validation letter jetter you know what it's like when people just go all territorial at a club angry goth girl was ruder than shit and totally deserved that smackdown she was probably on meth or something too he's right though i really do look like five miles of bad road i'm just gonna mix a facial in the kitchen while i type the rest of this i should redo my petty too because i ended up walking home in the end and my feet are in bad shape. Why did I walk home? I can almost hear you ask. Well, turns out that the bus wasn't there when I came out. There were a bunch of police cars all over and ambulance, but I didn't go any closer. I guess I'm still spooked about Tony. Anyway, someone said they were looking for somebody wearing these metal claws or something because some guy in the back of the bus earlier was all cut up bad and... The back of his head was bashed in? I sat down real hard then on the curb with my hands in my pits. That got me going, I can tell you. Was that me? What was happening and why was it so hard to concentrate? I stood there by the edge of the curb at the corner of Washington feel real sorry for myself until I saw these two homeless types watching me. That creepy feeling kicked in a high gear and I got up, started walking home. It was about four blocks until I realized they were following me. It was a total freak fest. With the state of mind I was in, I was like, great, and one day I'm going to be exonerated for three accidental deaths on account of being murdered by junkies. I hung a right on Meridian, but they turned after me, so I gave it two more blocks until I reached the Lincoln Starbucks and ducked between two buildings. I was just going to hide there and watch them go by, but the dude stopped right outside. I could see them clearly by the street light and hold shit did they look bad we're talking grayish drooping faces with hair missing off one of them total crypt keeper stuff here the guy missing hair was clearly trying to say something but it came out all garbled half spanish half 
mumbling druggy shit. He spit out a tooth and I was all, gross, why are you following me? I can call the cops. Although, as I said it, I realized I hadn't seen my purse since the bathroom. Ah, crap, my new lip gloss was gone. And my phone. The other one was a taller black guy and he had a real low voice rumbling and kind of nice if it wasn't on Mr. Creepy Stalker Scarecrow face. He says, we were wondering what to do. You don't smell like the others. And I'm all, what? Others? Those other girls? I'm wearing Pimi. This shit is 75 bucks a bottle. Damn straight if I don't smell like them. And he looks all confused while the other one says something that sounds like he's gargling his teeth while humming three blind mice. The black guy nods like he can speak gargled mice and looks back at me. Ramon says you don't smell like food. Uh, what do you say? But I said you look good. Uh, you can't be like us. Like us, my ass. I fumed. <laughs> I'm no junkie trash. I let him know right off. I may be a little rude, but what do you want? It ain't been a night. I am not like you at all. Um, yeah, but you're dead too, the black guy tries to point out, and Ramon there nods like he's trying to snap his own head off. I'm sure he was trying to say more, but I just burst right in. The fuck I am! Do I look dead to you? Tired, maybe? Pissy? Yes. Scared? Oh, fuck yeah! But I am not dead. I practically screamed at this guy. Your heart ain't beating, the black guy pointed out, just as calm as anything. Well, that caught me up. I mean, what the hell was he talking about? I put my fingers up to my neck and felt right around. Health class was not a long time ago, but I ought to feel my pulse right there, right? Nothing. Nada. Zip. Okay. Panic time. I freaked out 10 ways from Sunday and ended up on my ass against the brick wall of that tiny alley with my head between my knees. Ramon turned to look away into the street with his arms all crossed while black guy was real sweet but awkward as he tried to pat my head. Hey, it's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but you look really good for a corpse. Real pretty. Yeah, not like us. I got stabbed. Ramon over there was shot three times. That's why he looks so bad. He was actually buried in a dumpster and baked for a day while he couldn't get out. That's why he's not all there. Ramon stood still as if ignoring us or simply unaware he was under discussion. The black man went on real slow like he was explaining crossing the street to a kid. I'm Abraham. There's a whole bunch of us out there these days. No clue why. But we ain't staying dead. Most of them are like Ramon, barely able to think. I've been looking after him since I, uh, since it started. I sat there for a few minutes and, I think, head between my knees with my forehead in my arms. It was only the stink of old coffee and cigarettes that finally penetrated my little pity party and the realization that I was sitting at a pool of something cold and sticky in my favorite little black dress. Well, what did it matter? I was dead. I held out a hand and without another word, Abraham helped me up. This time I stopped and looked him up and down real good. Something in my face made him open up his jean jacket and pull a bloodstained shirt to show me a deep stab wound over his heart. Put it away, I said. I was a little sharp. I don't want to see that kind of shit right now. I just want to go home. For the first time, I saw Abraham blink. Home? He sounded a little surprised. You still living at home? You ain't hurt anyone there? No, I burst out with the guilty rush of misery over Tony, angry goth girl, the bus jerk, mingled with relief that my roommate was out of town. Everything's fine. Just fine. Maybe you two should come along and tell me about it, this whole dead thing. Something isn't right. I don't believe in that life-after-death business. Ghosts 
and spirits and stuff. It's all fake. I don't know that from the movies and special effects, uh, but I was having a harder time wrapping my head around my own lack of pulse. We'll see you get home safe, Abraham promised, and Ramon grunted. They fell in behind me as I left the alley, my own creepy escort service. I didn't have anything to say until I got home. The sun was just starting to peek up over the buildings and palm trees, and the two guys looked uneasy. At least, Abraham did. Ramon just looked sickly and vague. You gonna be okay? I asked them at last. The sun ain't real good on our skin. Abraham sounded a little sheepish at that. I don't know what came over me, but they saw me home fair enough. I couldn't let them just... I don't even know a word for it. Suffer? Burst into flames? No, that's vampires. Which, for the record, I don't believe in either. Anyway, they're both down in the crawl space under my house. I don't know why I invited them to stay under there, but I did and Abraham said thanks. So, LJ peeps, I hope to heck you're reading this because I have no clue what to do next. I still don't quite believe I'm not fully alive, but let's just say I've done some experimenting with a knife in the kitchen. And I can tell you from my cutting years, things are not the same. Maybe I've just got a little disease or a side effect from the drugs still in my system. I'll talk about it to Abraham when he comes out after sunset. If he comes out. Otherwise, I'm going to call for the sheriff anonymously to get two corpses out from under the rental. LucindaWoo.LiveJournal.com So apparently that saying goes, I'll sleep when I'm dead. It's a load of crap. You don't sleep at all when you're dead. I've been walking around the house all day here. My roommate will shit bricks to see that I've cleaned every square inch of the floor and scrubbed the kitchen. I've also apparently spent the last 10 hours watching the news compulsively and reading pretty much everything on the internet. Apparently my own tragedy isn't that unique, except for the fact that I am much more attractive than all the other people out there, N not alive, that are still moving. There's reports that the girl at the club was chewed on as well as slashed open and trampled underfoot in the riot. I don't remember biting her. Did I bite her? I'm reading upward in my LJ. Well, it says I bit. But I have her teeth marks in my hand and I hope she started it. Crap, am I turning into a crazed movie zombie? Am I like afternoon of the living dead that are bored out of their skulls because they can't go outside? I tried it just after noon for science. No, there was no bursting into flames, but boy, the smell kicked in real fast and the top of my foot started to look purple quick. Total yucky. I hit it with some toner, then night cream, and have the whole thing wrapped up in an ace bandage, keep the moisturizer on it. While I was at it, I painted my toes red to match my nails. My face looked worse too. I say look because I have found an answer. Since I can't feel very much, I grabbed a stapler off my roommate's desk and spent a little time tightening the old forehead and cheekbone areas at the hairline. With my bangs fluffed out and a neat trim around the sides to frame my face, I totally look normal again. Okay, as normal as me and about a pound of Mac can manage. I should have bought stock in this company. <laughs> they make amazing product and it normalizes my skin tone back to neutral. I feel like I should be crying or freaking out more, but I really just feel this ocean of calm whenever I stop focusing. I tried pretending I was upset and punched through the wall in my room. It was accidental. Why are you stronger when you're dead? Is it because muscles don't hurt? There's no Wikipedia for this shit. The boys are each in a shower now. They crawled out as the sun was setting, and when I saw them on the doorstep, I just pointed them in towards the bathrooms. They looked surprised as hell, but Abraham actually said thank you before they got in the water. I had time between skin treatments to go through my roommate's closet, see if she had anything from her boyfriends that used to stay over. I pulled out a few things and left them outside each door with cross fingers for a fit. The news story is talking about how two guys the police tasered then shot to death in another part of town last night were both on drugs. One of them identified the drug as Vanilla Sky, and that sounded really familiar, so I'm looking up in another window to try to ignore the thudding sounds in the shower next door. 
Well, Lord fuck a duck. Vanilla Sky and Purple Wave are basically the same. So is bath salts. This is some freaky shit here. So all the guys the police have had to do massive damage to stop. Their autopsies are all coming back with the same zombie making drug. And that's what Dorinda gave me? Oh, fuck, Dorinda. Is she okay after the cameo fiasco? I've got a call. She was on that stuff. More later. LucindaWu.LiveJournal.com Dorinda's missing, her boyfriend says. But his voice was all nervous sounding. I want to go over there, but I'm not sure what to do about my two strays. Maybe it's time to break some serious rules around here or borrow my roommate's car. I think if ever there was an emergency, she'd consider my death to be one as long as it only happened once. I've been threatened with death, if anything, ever breathes even on her Corolla. Abraham cleaned up nicer than I expected. Ramon still smells like death warmed over and then left out a plate for the cat. I introduced them both to Mr. Stapler and MAC and I think we're all past for okay as long as nobody looks too closely. I added just a little eyeliner to Abraham's eyes. I think it makes him look more exotic. He didn't say anything, but I think he was secretly pleased I spent the time and attention. The new shirt helped too, and he looked, he looked good. Not clubbing good, mind, but I'd have gone out for burgers with him. Ramon went out to wander around the backyard, so I asked Abraham about where they hooked up and all. I told him about the purple wave coincidence and asked if he'd ever tried it. Abraham wasn't real quick to answer, but finally admitted that that was what he dealt. Ramon was his source for the purple wave and showed up all crazy. Abraham shot him, then dumped him in the dumpster, but says it was definitely after Ramon had stabbed him. Abraham says he freaked out too when he realized he wasn't dying and the next night went back to check on Ramon, found the guy all rotting in the garbage and confused. Now Ramon follows him around like some kind of obedient dog and definitely isn't all there. I told him that was pretty fucked up and he laughed like I was Jon Stewart on Comedy Central. Ramon came back in then. I think he ate something in the yard. Hope it was just a squirrel or that cat that yowls all night. I tried to ask him about Purple Wave and Ramon gargled a bit, but Abraham understood him well enough to say that he'd been on it when he died. Anyway, I'm worried as hell about Dorinda now. Kisses the St. Christopher if he's the patron saint of Toyota Corollas to keep him out of harm's way as we head to where Dee lives with her guy. LucindaWoo.LiveJournal.com Oh, LJ World, things are mighty fucked up in Miami. This may be my last post, but I didn't want to leave you hanging about what went down. Learning that we'd all taken the same drug for a grim sort of ride, let me tell you, I don't know what or if the boys were thinking, but I had a kind of anger growing in me I'd never known, not even at Alexandria and Tony before. That was pain and misery. This was stone cold, pissed off power bitch feeling and I was riding it to the moon. You gotta understand, it's not that I'd rather be dead than a zombie, especially not right now when I've just met someone. But the people making that drug took something from me and just because I can't think of a way to talk about it doesn't make it any less real. I was making a choice to end things and because of some chemical concoction, my choice was taken away from me. I'm obsessed for blocks. The three of us arrived at Dorinda's place. She lives near the airport as I think I mentioned in the post last month about her epic party in one of those renovated warehouses. We knocked on the door and her boyfriend answered. I could tell right off something was not right because Pete was all jittery and strung out more than usual even he wouldn't even let us in the door he fed us some story about how d didn't come home from the club last night and then he shut the door in our faces ramon went wandering around the back where the trash was and abraham and i followed i'm gonna ignore what he did to the stray dog that came sniffing his feet and focus on the important stuff like finding dorinda in the trash bags yeah bags multiple Ramon was pulling her head out when Abraham and I came around the corner of the little trash enclosure thing. I was about to bite in her cheek when I made him stop. I think it was the first time I was glad for this weird zen thing I've got going on since dying. 
I was upset and freaked out and pissed off, but I didn't break down or anything like I would have a few days ago. I told Ramon no biting. Just would he please get Dorinda together and put her somewhere safe that the police could find. Ramon got busy right away putting all her pieces together and laid him out beside the dumpster in mostly the right order. We left him there and told him to catch up when he was done. Abraham didn't say anything in all of this, just let me lead the way. But when we got back to the door, he touched my shoulder and looked real sad. We gotta do something, he said. If you're right about the drug, it can't go on. I nodded and surprised us both by kissing his cheek. I rang the doorbell again at Dee's place. This time when the door opened, Abraham stuck his foot out and forced it the rest of the way open into Pete's face. Pete pulled out a gun and fired twice, but Abraham just grunted as the bullets hit and grabbed Pete to start pinching. You know, for a minute there, I had kind of an echo of my old girly reaction. Wish that were my guy, I thought, watching them beat the shit out of a bastard who totally deserved it. One, two, fast as grease lightning. But then I realized I could smell Dorinda. Well, Dorinda's blood and white diamonds. I hadn't realized how strong the smell could be, but it made my mouth water and my eyes tear up at this proof that she died here. Two more guys bumped into me as they were coming out of the kitchen and tried to shove past me on their way to the living room. They were pulling guns, too, and ignoring me for just being another pretty face. I think I even recognized one of them from that party I talked about. I think I kissed him. Still, this was no time for sentiment, and I grabbed both of their necks from behind and slammed their heads together. Kissy face just fell right down away with his head flopping, and the other one turned on me and fired his gun. I felt it go into my stomach the way you feel a softball hit you in the belly at P.E. I oofed a little, and before I could rally to slice that motherfucker up with my stilettos, Abraham was on him. This time it seemed almost personal. My guy lost himself enough to rip the fucker's throat out with his teeth. I didn't stop him. There was almost a visceral pleasure watching him go to town chewing on this bastard that shot me. Although I couldn't really hear the slurping noises with how my ears were ringing from all the gunshots. I followed the smell of Dorinda into the kitchen where there's all sorts of chemical equipment set up. I looked down at where I'd been shot and touched at it. There was a little goo oozing out of the hole, so I went and grabbed a towel that hung on the edge of the stove. More footsteps, and I smelled Ramon's particular odor enter the house too. There was lots of fresh meat for my boys, and they were both busy for a while as I held my towel to goo and looked around the kitchen lab. I leaned forward and sniffed at a pile of lavender powder in the bowl at the end after the burners and covered pot and touched some of it to my tongue. Instantly, everything sprang into sharper focus. Colors whirled and turned brighter, and I could suddenly hear again what the guys were up to in the other room. That's the purple wave, all right. Those clowns were definitely making it. They were making death, and those boys deserved to die for what they did to Dorinda. Meanwhile, I had goo. Uh, you ever have that moment of what the hell? Uh, for an instant, I wondered if since the drug turned me into a zombie, it could fix it. I took a dab of the powder on my fingers and lifted it to the towel to swipe at the goo there. Then a whole handful just pressing it in. It stung. There was actual pain, which I hadn't felt since I died. But nothing else. And I still had a hole in me when I moved my hand away. So, so much for magic cures. I still grabbed up a few baggies and filled them. You know, just in case. Because it did make the colors brighter. Abraham came in then and looked around. He met my eyes and I nodded. This was it. Ramon gurgled something at us. I don't get it, I admitted aloud at last. Can't understand the thing he says. He says we should blow it up, Abraham said, and Ramon nodded. 
For all his lurching, he still moved quickly enough over to the gas stove and started monkeying with the oven and burners. He blew out the pilots and turned all the burners on full and then looked back at us both. There was a long moment as we stared at Ramon before I kind of nodded. I got it. Abraham did too, and the boys shook bloody hands. Abraham and I turned to go, and before I paused, I pointed towards the sink. Hands! He understood the look on my face, and I actually grinned a little while before washing his lower arms, face, and even neck to get the gore off. As we left the house, my hand somehow slipped into his damp one, and his fingers curled around mine. We went back to the car, mercifully unmolested in this crap neighborhood, and I pulled carefully out into traffic. I never even heard the explosion with my ears still ringing. That's all there is to say, really. Abraham and I agree that this people turning into zombies business has to stop. We're trying to find all the remaining stuff on the street and make sure there aren't any more labs. It takes a little more makeup and staples every day, and maybe a teensy blow here and there, but it's kind of a holy calling after our own unholy fashion. Abraham says he'll stick with me, and we're going to keep going as long as we can, running up the victims like us and taking care of everyone. It's nice. He called me his girl, and I finally felt something. So thanks for all your sympathy, your encouragement from out there on the net. Having friends like you there somewhere makes it all okay in the end. I wish I'd realized that sooner. That was awesome. <laughs> so let this message go out to you. If you've got a story or a book out there and you're interested in having Alice read to you, she did that cold. No rehearsal, no discussion, no pronunciation. She's amazing. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Today's sponsor was Watch Your Assumptions. Mm-hmm.